unstable and precarious, but there was peace. Conflicts were solved quickly, and no battle campaign lasted more than two years, nor did these have an adverse effect on political and economic development. Nevertheless, it was possible to guess that future instability would concern economic antagonisms at a time when the economy had become the basis for international relations. To this was added colonial friction and a political and military system which had been unheard of since then, armed peace. This situation led to increased rivalry and suspicion, to such an extent that when Nicholas II called for disarmament in 1898, Germany said it was just a Russian trap. Ultranationalism contributed to European imbalance at the end of the 19th century. Russia spoke of a pan-Slavic movement, Germany of a pan-Germanic movement, of Germanizing Lorraine, the region of France partly ceded to Germany in 1871, which was to be the seed of future discord. In Italy, a new concept was in vogue, irredentismo. Meanwhile, the Balkan states were trying to get organized. The growth of nationalist feeling made problems more acute, leading to an explosion in the 20th century. Central Europe was about to reach boiling point due to the anti-Slav policy of Austro-Hungary and Bohemia. National pride, chauvinism, soon became noticeable. The press contributed to whipping up feeling. Nationalism was defended from paper trenches with an arsenal of words which exaggerated the good actions of the home nation and ridiculed others, thus leading to a rise in temperature. Moreover, the desire to conquer new markets, typical of economic imperialism, led to unrest. And by the end of the 19th century, all the nations wanted the same thing, to place their products in the undeveloped nations and gain access to their raw materials. Western politics were imbued with a sense of superiority towards the rest of the world. The desire to control territory was a result of an excessive interest in forming empires. Commercial and economic interests demanded this at a time in history when Europe was a backyard in comparison with the immensity of Africa and Asia. The opening of the Suez Canal and the discoveries in Africa led to Britain seizing Alexandria and Cairo in 1882 after a number of cynically planned incidents. Egypt came under British domination, as did Sudan in 1885. Nigeria was colonized, and soon Uganda and the Zanzibar coast the Cape Colony and the countries of the Zambezi as far as Lake Tanganyika. Britain took over the richest lands from Egypt to South Africa in a wide band broken only by the Belgian Congo and German East Africa. In 1881, the Boer rebelled against the British in the Transvaal. William E. Gladstone, the Prime Minister, freed the rebels, shocking the British upper classes which had a low opinion of Gladstone, who wished to extend suffrage, give home rule to Ireland, democratize education and the administration, and give independence to some colonies. The colonies were an external sign of power. The French Third Republic, with politicians like Jules Ferry, built up a French empire from 1880 onwards. It completed the occupation of Indochina, taking Tonkin in 1885, and integrating the territory of Laos in this colony after annexing Burma in 1888. In 1885, Jules Ferry, the French Foreign Secretary, explained the situation to the Congress of Deputies. Gentlemen, a colony is a market. In Africa, the French imposed a protectorate on Algeria and Tunisia in 1881. 
After the conquest of the desert, it extended its control over Senegal, Western Sudan in 1894, and Madagascar. In 1882, it conquered the kingdom of Daomi in the Gulf of Guinea and Gabon, Chad, a large part of Morocco, Mauritania and territories in the heart of Africa, and on its Atlantic coast, fell into French hands. Portugal also did well due to its traditional alliance with Britain. It consolidated its control of Angola, Mozambique, and a part of Guinea near the river Gambia. Germany arrived late for the share out, but its colonial empire was a large one. Italy was happy to have the desert of Libya and far of Somalia. Spanish rights over the 10th part of Morocco, a part of the Sahara, and some jungle land in Equatorial Guinea were acknowledged. In 1897, coinciding with Queen Victoria's jubilee as she was celebrating her 60th anniversary on the throne, India suffered a terrible plague. British colonialism was noted for its rapacity and racism. No one wished to be left behind in the race. The United States seized the Hawaiian Islands in 1893. That same year, Britain requested the mediation of the United States with Venezuela over Guyana but Cleveland reminded Queen Victoria of the Monroe Doctrine of America for the Americans, meaning America is ours. In 1871, the Franco-Prussian War ended. This conflict laid the political foundations for the 20th century, with France returning to a Republican regime and the birth of the German Empire with Chancellor Bismarck. In order to maintain the balance of power, a system of secret alliances was organized, leading to the creation of blocs. This was a system of Bismarck, the outstanding figure until 1891. The Iron Chancellor proposed consolidating the integration of Alsace-Lorraine into the Second Reich and endeavored to isolate France by forming the Triple Alliance or the Alliance of the Emperors, Wilhelm I of Germany, Alexander II of Russia, who was to be assassinated on March 13, 1881, and Franz Joseph of Austria. Fear of becoming isolated forced Germany to pact with Austria to protect itself from Russia and from France. Everyone felt threatened. The secret alliances and the exacerbated nationalism destabilized political life in the 20th century. The change of generation at the end of the century made the differences more acute and aggravated the problems. In 1890, Bismarck left politics together with the men who had forged the unity of Germany. They were replaced in power by an ambitious generation who wanted German world hegemony under Wilhelm II. International antagonistic feeling was such that one little spark might set off an immense conflagration. Thus, a number of small local wars were fought at the end of the century. In the Far East, the war broke out between China and Japan after a popular uprising in Korea when its sovereign asked China and Japan for help. In July 1894, Japan sent troops, but instead of helping the sovereign, they overthrew him and forced his successor to declare war on China. The Japanese defeated the Chinese at Pyongyang, crossed the river Yalu, and occupied Port Arthur. Peking and Tokyo signed the Treaty of Shimofuseki in April 1895 and ceded Formosa and the Port Arthur Peninsula. Russia, aided by its Western allies, forced Japan to abandon Port Arthur. This was the start of the Russian occupation of Manchuria in 1900. Small wars broke out, but there were still wars and involved violence. While the Italians insisted in their attempts to conquer Ethiopia, defended by King Menelik, another conflict with unforeseeable repercussions was about to break out when George I of Greece supported the anti-Turkish uprising in February 1897. That same year in Spain, Antonio Canovas, the president of the government, was assassinated. The war with the United States after the sinking of the Maine in the Bay of Havana ended the hopes of the period of the Restoration. The century ended with the assassination of Umberto I of Italy and the succession to the throne of Victor Emmanuel III. The years from the middle of the 19th century to the start of the 20th century were vital. In that short period of time, the world changed. There was one word for it, progress, the magic word that summed it all up. The train developed to an extraordinary extent. Half a million kilometers of track encircled the earth, and the rise of the railway benefited the economy and spurred the commercial activity of emerging countries like Canada, 
where the Canadian Pacific linked the Atlantic and the Pacific in 1876. Russia built the Trans-Siberian Railway with a length of 7,500 kilometers in 1891. Railway transport of goods was joined by a rise in the number of steamships. Around 1898, transport prices fell by half. At the end of the 19th century, agriculture was boosted. Immense territories came under the plow. This was easy as land cost little and its produce reached the markets cheaply and fast. The combine harvester had been invented and in 1889, the petrol driven tractor was being manufactured. The American agricultural trading centers, the enormous production of Russia, which bought the first machines with wheat and set up its first factories. India began to rationalize its cereal crops. Australian wool and the huge meat production of the South of South America were boosted from 1875 with the refrigerated slaughterhouses invented by Daniel Holden shortly before. The boom in agriculture and fishing in the vast emerging world was to Europe's disadvantage. In 1890, Britain was self-sufficient in wheat, but in 1900, it was importing 60% of its cereals. Similar trends were occurring in Germany and other European countries due to the abandonment of the countryside and migration to the cities, where the factories required workers at a time when there was much immigration to the United States, Canada, Australia, Argentina, and Brazil. It is extremely important for understanding the history of the 20th century to know that Germany became the major European industrial power. It doubled Britain's production of coal and produced five times more iron and steel. It was the motor of Europe. France also accelerated its industrial machine. In 1890, it used 864,000 horsepower of steam, and in 1898, it was consuming a million more. The rise of the railway, which had to supply huge amounts of cast iron and steel, brought with it the steel industry. At the end of 1890, the world iron production was 27 million tons, and in 1899, it had doubled. The same happened with steel, which resulted in a second industrial revolution in 1890. New industries arose based on the combustion engine, electricity and chemistry. Nothing would ever be the same again. Industrial and economic colonization began. A monetary economy which encouraged loans was created. Great financial institutions made banking fashionable and big businesses got used to turning to the banks for help. In 1985, the world economy changed. The good economic climate required a political structure that would encourage peace and guarantee order. In 1899, on the initiative of Tsar Nicholas II, the Hague Conference was held. Americans, Europeans, and Asian powers agreed to solve their conflicts through arbitration. All of them signed. The end of the century political structure laid the foundations of the 20th century, but the changes in lifestyle were due to the great inventions. Technology was beginning to determine man's destiny and his likes, satisfying his needs and creating new ones. Higher purchasing made it easy for everyone to buy everything and society began to surmount class differences. People tended to consume the same products and dress in accordance with the pattern laid down by the trade and promoted by publicity. Geniuses invented useful things. Edison and Marconi were two examples of this. The discovery of Hertz waves in 1887 led to a revolution in communications. Hermann Hollerith laid the foundations of computing in 1880 with his statistical machine using perforated cards. The first electric bulb was invented in 1879. Two years later, Edison, the inventor of the incandescent lamp, set up a generator in Pearl Street, the first street with artificial lighting. Ten years later, he founded the General Electric Company. In 1876, Alexander Graham Bell gave the first demonstrations of his telephone in the Philadelphia Exposition. This invention was to revolutionize the world. In 1878, the first telephone exchange was set up in New Haven, Connecticut. One year later, the telephone reached Europe. The development of the telephone and the extent to which it was accepted. In 1885, there were only 70,000 subscribers in the world. In 1873, the typewriter was invented. 
and from then on there were important technical and scientific inventions every year. The submarine, photography, stereo sound, the car, the zeppelin, the fountain pen, the motorcycle, the tire, cinema, radio and the teletype. A mass of brilliant inventions changed the lifestyle of everyone and brought mankind into a new era. In 1896, Antoine H. Becquerel, the physicist, observed that uranium emitted active radiation when placed in front of photographic plates. He had discovered radiation. Louis Pasteur demonstrated that microorganisms cause disease, and Robert Koch isolated the tuberculosis germ. In the world of sport, the Olympics, an event held in classical times, was recuperated due to the work of Pierre de Fredy, the Baron de Coubertin. The first modern Olympics were held in Athens and was attended by 285 athletes from 13 countries. Baseball received its consecration as the king of sports in America as it boomed in popularity. Tennis started to attract the ladies. In 1884, Maud Watson won the first Wimbledon championship. In the world of boxing, there was an extraordinary bout between Andy Bowen and Jack Burke one April afternoon in New Orleans. The fight lasted seven hours, and both boxers ended up in a bad way. However, cinema was the sensation of the times. Thomas Alva Edison was the first to print film, although the first public showings were the work of Louis Lumiere with a device he called the cinematograph, worked by a handle which passed 16 stills per second. On the 28th of December, 1894, there were 33 spectators waiting at the doors of the Grand Café to see the first projection, but it was to have a tremendous impact. The cinema began with candid films three minutes long, such as Children Quarreling, The Workers Leaving the Lumiere Factory, The Arrival of the Train in the Station. The subject did not matter. What mattered was that this invention eternalized man's actions, recording his life. Young Georges Melier was enchanted by the first projection of the brothers Lumiere. He asked them to sell him one of their machines, but they would not. From then on, he put all his efforts into trying to get his own equipment and filmed extraordinary films such as Trip to the Moon in 1902 and The Dreams of an Astronomer in 1898. Painting took on a social coloring. Claude Monet, the pioneer of Impressionism, went to and fro painting landscapes. Degas painted horse races and dances. Renoir captured the passing vibrant impression of the fleeting moment. Impressionism was followed by the neo-impressionism of Serrat, Van Gogh, the Dutchman who died in a delirium of light and color, and Toulouse-Lautrec. It was a very special time with Impressionists living with symbolists such as Cezanne and Gauguin. In 1889 in Europe, Gustave Eiffel built his graceful tower, an astonishing metallic construction requiring a million rivets for a structure weighing 10,000 tons and rising to 312 meters over Paris. From 1892, architecture was booming due to materials such as reinforced concrete, fire resistant at a time when people were terrified of fire. From 1888 on, prefabricated panels lightened the weight of walls. The Barcelona Universal Exposition was inaugurated by Queen Maria Cristina in 1888 and showed the world the drive and vitality of Spanish life. One year later, the Universal Exposition of Paris was inaugurated. The American Hemisphere was in the process of formation throughout the second half of the 19th century. Between 1870 and the start of the 20th century, 15 new states were constituted. In less than 30 years, the population doubled, reaching 75 million. The key to American industrialization was its domestic market, which grew with the waves of immigrants, a market with no customs barriers or restraints, almost without taxes. The West, with agriculture and cattle rearing, was behind the Democrats, the standard bearers of free trade. The trade unions were established, Grover Cleveland, whose last term in office ended in 1897, had left the ranks of the Democratic Party. It was the eve of American capitalism. The South became a textile giant. In the Great Lakes region, the canning industry was growing, and the discovery of oil spread a new gold fever. The new civil leaders born in the more modest classes valued work more than the worker. 
John Rockefeller set up the first oil refinery in the United States and founded the Standard Oil Company. Andrew Carnegie became the steel king and Pierre Point Morgan the king of finance. But no one knew how to rid the country of racism, nor did they wish to. In 1882, the immigration of poor people and coloreds was limited, putting them on the same footing as the diseased and criminals. In South America, stability improved after 1880, after the crisis following independence. A new way of thinking based on the exploitation of resources and exporting made progress possible. Democracy was established in some countries, but totalitarian regimes were about to arise. Mexico, Chile, Brazil, and Argentina were among the most advanced countries. Work began on a gigantic project even more ambitious than Suez in 1882, the excavation of the Panama Canal under the direction of Ferdinand de Lesseps. In the social area, the foundations of the 20th century were laid between 1870 and 1900. The workers became aware of their strength and the trade unions demonstrated their importance. Karl Marx, who died in 1883, had published works dealing with subjects such as added value, salaries, prices, before publishing Das Kapital on the eve of the economic depression, which was a feature of the end of the century. Everything became difficult and complex. Politics had to take a new dimension into account. The proletariat, which had become aware of its power to overthrow governments and policies. Not even Sherlock Holmes, the clever detective invented by Conan Doyle in 1887, could put right the often difficult situation the nations were led into by social agitation. In 1877, Leo Tolstoy had published Anna Karenina, and in 1892, Gerhard Altman wrote The Weavers of Silesia, a drama on the social revolution which drew attention to the fact that the 20th century would be the century of the masses and that social disorders would increase. Strikes became general even in the United States, where the eight-hour working day was vindicated. The British trade unions and the workers in all of Europe demanded the same things, and socialism spread throughout the world. The church, which Marx proposed should disappear, rose to the occasion. Leo IX, the workers' pope, showed he had a social frame of mind in his encyclicals. His long, lucid pontificate covered the last quarter of the 19th century and became a sterile struggle to recuperate the papal states lost by his predecessor, Pius IX. However, he was able to re-establish the relations between the modern states and the papacy. Monetary stability, the fall in prices, the improvement in the standard of living, the chance to immigrate and bright industrial prospects made the final years of the 19th century boom years, although the seeds of discord had been sown and were watered by territorial ambitions, economic rivalry, and the struggle for markets. But prosperity was somewhat fictitious. The middle classes lived well at the expense of the lower classes. Industrial development favored the capitalists, the businessmen, and the shareholders. The concentration of industry led to massification in the suburbs. The worker despised the rich kids and the owners while he dreamed of revolution. Was the 19th century ending or the 20th century beginning? How could one know if the horizon was brightening with the first light of dawn or the dying light of the evening? The century began with tragedy. In April 1906, a great earthquake destroyed the city of San Francisco in California and left more than a thousand dead. It was a terrible omen for the start of the century. The fears McLuhan had expressed were going to be true. The 19th century was one of reflection and prudence. The 20th century began with evident signs of tragedy, with mankind heading towards unceasing confrontation. Episode two, The World Before 1914.
A unique and extraordinary eclipse occurred during the first months of 1900. For a minute and a half, and hidden by the moon, the sun projected a huge shadow that advanced at a rate of 70 kilometers per second from the Pacific to the Atlantic. At dusk, it had come to rest the Red Sea. It was a dark and gloomy omen for a century that would be predestined to become a time of violence. From its beginnings, a clear obsession marked the 20th century. Progression, innovation, changing the world. As a symbol of disproportionate confidence that bordered on arrogance, the first rigid airship in history took to the air. After 25 years of work, Count von Zeppelin saw his cigar-shaped airship rise more than 400 meters into the skies, a craft that would popularize his name, the Zeppelin. The 20th century would be a century of the masses and of social conflict that grew in importance until 1905. Many saw these events as a threat to economic development. Continuous strikes, disorders, and demands only contributed to invigorate social activity. They became the motors for progress. In spite of social achievements, unrest spread from Argentina to England. The Workers' Federation was founded in Chile, while Argentina saw the creation of the Workers' Regional Confederation and the first labor unions appeared in Colombia. In Spain, the 1902 general strike organized by the anarchists accentuated unrest and seriously altered social peace. Street riots in Barcelona brought troops out into the streets and constitutional rights were suspended. Many died and many more were arrested. Social problems were a permanent concern until the beginning of the Great War. 1903 saw the death of Pope Leo XIII, a man who in 1900 was fully aware that social and economic differences bore the seeds of discord. He was the Pope of the workers. In his encyclical Rerum Novarum, of new things, he exalted the world to help the underprivileged and to listen to the problems of the working class. The women's suffrage movement, the heir to women's rights groups of the mid-19th century, demanded the right to vote, which they partially achieved in England in 1918. Women entered the university for the first time. In Italy, the anarchist Bresci shot at Umberto I in Monza, practically at the same time that someone made an attempt on the life of the Prince of Wales in Brussels. In this same campaign, organized by international anarchism, American President William McKinley was fatally shot in 1901, while other attempts were planned on the lines of the sovereigns of England, Spain, Austria, Portugal, and Russia. The unexpected and tragic death of McKinley in the United States brought Theodore Roosevelt to the presidency. He continued in his predecessor's imperialist footsteps. Queen Victoria died in 1901, and with her way of conducting politics. England decided to turn its back on isolationism, but all the attempts by Joseph Chamberlain to better relations with Germany were employed by Emperor William II to muddy Anglo-Russian relations and to poison the political panorama. Europe lived through a time of alliances which eventually coalesced into wary blocs. The Entente Cordiale of England and France that would later be joined by Russia and Serbia, and the Triple Alliance, constituted by Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. Even so, Italy played its own game. Victor Manuel III came to a secret agreement with France, which recognized Italy's rights over the Libyan provinces of Tripoli and Cyrenaica. But it was a tense world due to overriding suspicions, conflict, and colonial clashes, together with a fight for markets and concessions. Desertions and clashes came as no surprise, while espionage and counter-espionage, sometimes real and other times imaginary, were commonplace phenomena. In 1905, German Emperor William II landed his forces in Tangier and proclaimed himself the defender of Islam. He urged the European powers to come to grips with the Moroccan problem, especially after his meeting with Nicholas II of Russia, which led nowhere. A conference was held in Algeciras in 1906 at the request of the Kaiser. Germany claimed a major diplomatic victory, although it was a ferric victory since France and Spain established protectorates in the territory. By 1907, England had agreed to smooth over differences which arose with Russia due to their respective colonial activities in Asia. Russia recognized English rights in Afghanistan and in the Persian Gulf, while Russian and English authorities agreed to leave Tibet in peace. At the same time, England induced Japan to sign a friendship agreement with Nicholas II. An extraordinarily powerful bloc was formed as a result. 
France, England and Russia with their respective colonial empires and with the approval and connivance of the Japanese Empire. The Triple Entente was born. Serbia was a sore point for international politics. In 1903, King Alexander I and his wife were murdered, along with the Prime Minister, two brothers of the monarch and the Minister of War. The international panorama was complex. In 1904, Russia declared war on Japan, which had conducted a surprise attack on Port Arthur under Russian control. Japan defeated the Tsarist forces, and the military disaster was complete. Thousands died, and enormous quantities of armament fell into Japanese hands. Russia renounced its claims over Korea, and it lost control over half of Sakhalin Island. Japan strengthened its hold over Manchuria and became the dominant naval power in the Pacific. American President Theodore Roosevelt had to mediate, and in August 1905, the Treaty of Portsmouth was signed. Roosevelt's intervention earned him the 1906 Nobel Peace Prize. The Tsar imposed strict censorship, and the news came late. But when it did, disorders were unleashed, such as the mutiny aboard the battleship Potemkin. The incident occurred after an officer shot a sailor. The crew immediately mutinied, and a red flag was finally hoisted up the main mast of the warship, anchored in the Black Sea. That 27th of June witnessed the murder of all the ship's officers. In 1906, the Bosnian crisis almost sparked a war in the West. The foreign ministers of Russia, Izvolsky and Austria, Ardenthal, backed an imperialist policy for the Balkans. Russia sought a way out of the Black Sea by means of the Turkish Straits, while Austria did not want to lose its influence over the Balkans. Matters rushed to a head. In 1908, the Young Turk Party had many sympathizers in the army. It finally seized power in Constantinople with the overthrow of the Sultan Abdul Hamid. The modernization of the old empire was underway. Austria took advantage of the situation to annex Bosnia-Herzegovina. Russia agreed to this new political situation in exchange for Austria's help in obtaining its control over the Straits. The Austrians occupied Bosnia in October 1908. As a result, Bulgaria proclaimed its independence, while Greece annexed Crete. All the pieces were moving in a complex game of political chess. Italy, whose foreign policies were erratic, believed the time had come to reap the harvest of its diplomacy. Italy demanded Libya from Turkey. Turkey ignored its claims, and Italy decided to attack. In 1912, and during Italy's campaign in Libya, the first bombs were dropped from an airplane, cans of nitroglycerine. Just a few years later, in 1914, steel darts were launched at persons from early aircraft at the beginning of the First World War. The Italo-Turkish War was taken advantage of by both Bulgaria and Serbia, which signed a treaty sponsored by Russia in 1912. Greece and Montenegro signed the accord later. They all declared war on Turkey. Straining its resources to fight the Balkan states, Constantinople finally decided to sign the Treaty of Lausanne, which ceded Libya and the Dodecanese Islands, including Rhodes, to Italy in 1912. The Balkan nations also shared the spoils. Montenegro seized Scutari, the Serbs took Uskub and Monastir, the Greeks conquered Salonika, and the Bulgarians fought the Turks at the doors of Constantinople. Albania, meanwhile, declared its independence. To make matters worse, Romania invaded the Danube area, and even though Austria wanted to lend a hand to poor Bulgarian Tsar Ferdinand I by attacking Serbia, both Germany and Italy were opposed, thus the danger of a general conflict receded. Nationalist feelings were reinforced in Europe, countries began to rearm, and people began to suspect that war was around the corner. Diplomats became involved in long-range suspicions. Some peoples, like the Jews, began to feel the romantic call of a long-lost homeland, where anti-Semite persecutions and oppression would simply not exist. After meeting with the Sultan of Turkey, an Austrian Jewish journalist, Theodor Herzl, published a book in 1902 that would become the basis of Zionism, Alt Newland, Old New Land. He invited people of the same faith to emigrate to Israel, the land of their ancestors, where philologist Elitzer Ben Yehuda was preparing the grammar of modern-day Hebrew so that the new arrivals could begin to learn the biblical language. 
Events moved rapidly in the Arab world too. In 1912, Ibn Saud of Arabia wrested away the important province of al Hasa from the Turks. He was able to give his mercurial, volatile and nomadic people a collective ideal. England was especially concerned due to the growing numbers of German submarines that threatened British naval supremacy. From 1905 to 1913, there were four international crises, two involving the Balkans and two North Africa. The diplomatic skirmishes first and later the theatres of war put an end to the Turkish Empire. Nicholas II was a hopeless ruler. He was unable to surround himself with capable people. He was fickle and faithful to the last person who appeared on the scene, inevitably his wife. He was mistaken in his Russianization policies, limiting the influence of German and French cultures, while his anti-Semite practices deprived him of the support of the Jews, one of Russia's most enlightened social segments. In 1903, he stripped the Armenian church of its funds for education and social welfare, making enemies of his most valuable allies against the Turks. The student demonstrations of 1900, which were often joined by factory workers, were broken up by Cossack cavalry instead of by intelligent measures and dialogue. These were the seeds of the Bolshevik Revolution. In Russian, Bolshevik means majority, and Lenin used the term to describe his own party, employing the word Menshevik or minority when referring to the opposition. Together with his domestic policies, Nicholas II also adopted mistaken foreign policies. He believed it was unacceptable to give up Korea to the Japanese and conserve Manchuria. Due to his stubbornness, he lost the Baltic fleet in the Toshima Straits in the Russo-Japanese War of 1905. The crushing defeat against the Japanese brought much more than territorial losses. It brought revolution. On Sunday, January the 22nd, 1905, Bloody events were staged at the very doors of the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg, where Cossacks slaughtered more than a thousand demonstrators headed by the clergyman Gapon. What did they want? Simply to deliver to the Tsar a list of claims as a massive strike of 100,000 workers took place in the region. American policies in the early 20th century were designed to obtain a big slice of the colonial pie. The war declared against Spain in 1898 was a link in that chain. Following the sinking of the Maine in Havana Bay, an outraged American public opinion reacted to the fire-eating press and politicians and forced Congress, after consultations with President McKinley, to declare war on a colonial power. It was a short-lived war. That same year, Spain signed the Treaty of Paris, whereby it ceded Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines to the United States for $20 million. American foreign policy was imperialist in scope, especially following the annexions of Hawaii and the former Spanish islands. In other words, the United States assumed Spain's former position in the Americas and Asia, and especially in the Far East, where it had designs on splitting up China with the European powers. In 1903, the US bought the Canal Zone in Panama. After provoking the schism with Colombia, it renewed work on the canal, concluding them in 1914. Problems with trusts and cartels shaped domestic policies, and this led to the creation of the FBI in 1908, a federal body that would investigate and bring to justice everyone from land robbers in the West to magnates behind the trusts in the East. It was a brilliant moment for the country, since it was evident the United States was an emerging world power. An air force was created, but it was necessary to convince Congress of its future importance. Finally, construction on a military model that flew 58 kilometers per hour was authorized. Roosevelt was a discreet man. Hardly anyone knew that he was practically blind in his left eye. He also showed courage. In one of his re-election speeches, he was shot by a fanatic, and even though he was obviously bleeding, he didn't step down until he finished what he had to say. He was always proud of the fact that he was the first president who flew both in a plane and drove in a car. His successor, William Taft, led the United States from 1908 to 1912. He simply wasn't prepared for the new times. Even though honest, he lacked a vision. As a matter of fact, he was responsible for removing the progressive wing of his Republican Party, and a schism seemed inevitable.
The legendary frontier land of Buffalo Bill and Mae West slowly disappeared. February 1909 saw the death of the last great Apache Indian, Heronimo. He had held American cavalry in check for years. Significantly, the buffalo also began to disappear. There were scarcely a thousand head of the more than four million that had roamed the ranges of America 50 years before. Interventionist policies continued in Latin America under Thomas Woodrow Wilson, who became president in 1913. The 1910 uprising in Mexico against President Porfirio Diaz marked the beginning of the revolution headed by Francisco Madero and supported by Emiliano Zapata and Pancho Villa, who championed the down and out. The political situation had grown worse in Spain by 1906. The elections didn't help matters because fraud was suspected. King Alfonso XIII was the target of an assassination attempt in Paris. The king had married that same year the English princess Victoria Eugenia of Battenberg, and an attempt was made on their lives as they returned to their palace, the second on the monarch. The royal couple escaped unharmed, but 30 other people died. In Belgium, King Leopold II gave his country the Congo territories in 1907. Colonialism and imperialism went their chaotic way. It wasn't difficult to understand. Slaves, ivory, rubber, and wood weren't as profitable as in previous decades. They weren't enough to meet the administrative and military costs of that colony. Colonies only generated wars. The whole world witnessed, not without a certain amount of shame, the Boxer Rebellion in China in 1901. Not only did they lose, but they were forced to make 67 million pounds sterling in reparations. The first Nobel Prizes were awarded in 1901. One of the first award winners to receive the distinction from the King of Sweden was Wilhelm Röntgen for his invention of the X-ray. In 1905, Albert Einstein argued that there is no fixed reference point from which distances can be measured. It was the first law of relativity. The husband and wife team, Pierre and Marie Curie, were able to isolate polonium and radium, a discovery of extraordinary importance that earned them the Nobel Physics Prize in 1903. In 1911, Marie Curie also received the Nobel Chemistry Prize for determining the nature of radium. Freud began his psychoanalysis of Dora and published The Interpretation of Dreams, delving into the complexity of the psyche for the first time in medicine. Psychiatry flourished. The Spanish researcher Santiago Ramón y Cajal Nobel Prize winner for medicine in 1906 established the basis for a new scientific discipline histology, and the study of the nervous system. He also discovered the neuronal theory. In the world of sports, the century began with the Paris Olympiad. Sports in general became enormously popular. The Davis Cup was created and the International Cycling Union was founded. Many records were broken at the time. Women soon began to widely practice sports and excelled in many, such as golf. The 1904 Olympics were held in St. Louis, Missouri, and the 1908 edition, or fourth Olympiad, took place in London after Italy renounced the organization of the Games. Nineteen hundred is the year of the Universal Expo in Paris. More than 50 million people visited its many pavilions. Nothing caused more amazement than the cinematographer, electricity and Art Nouveau. Astonished visitors viewed a film that for the first time synchronized sound to picture. A fragment of Hamlet was screened with the voice of Sarah Bernhardt. In England, Edwin S. Porter presented his film, The Great Train Robbery, which, according to specialists, marks the beginning of cinematographic art and technique. Cinema took its first steps. In 1908, Blackton Courte, McKay and Sullivan transposed paper drawings to film. 
cartoons were born. But it wouldn't be until 1922 when Disney would start to make his first shorts. Improvements were made on cars. Windscreens were marketed in 1903, while bumpers or fenders followed in 1905. And just one year later, the rear view mirror. The car soon became man's best friend, and that of his better half. Urban growth created the phenomenon of city congestion. The taxi was created to resolve transport needs. The first appeared in Paris in 1904. This was also the golden age of the tram or streetcar, a romantic form of getting about where writers, painters and photographers set their tales of love. The first skyscrapers were built and neon lights began to substitute incandescent lamps in street advertising. Boulevards and streets got busier and the almost natural solution to ordering traffic soon appeared, traffic lights. The first two-color light was used in Cleveland at the corner of 105th Street with Euclid Avenue during August 1914. Four years later, the traffic light with the current three-color system was introduced in New York. The Central Station was inaugurated in that city in 1913, the largest in the world. The station could handle 143 wagons. It covered 32 hectares, while subterranean passageways led to nearby hotels and services. Transport was an important priority for industrialized countries. In the midst of all this euphoria, an iceberg sank the most luxurious and safest boat in the world one night in April 1912. This immense luxury liner sank just five days after having weighed anchor at the English port of Southampton. It was the Titanic. Even though previous attempts had been made, such as those by Englishman George Cayley or German Otto Lilienthal, the first effectively controlled flight, with the possibility of changing course and landing, was achieved in 1903 by Orville and Wilbur Wright with a 274-kilogram biplane and a four-cylinder, 12-horsepower engine. The aircraft was airborne for 59 seconds and covered a distance of a little over half a mile in the skies of North Carolina. Over the next decade, flying became a sport. In 1909, Frenchman Louis Blériot crossed the English Channel between Calais and Dover during a 37-minute flight. The aircraft was a four-blade propeller monoplane that heated up so much it had to be lubricated in flight. Radio broadcasting was in its very early stages, but its enormous possibilities were already heralded in 1910. Dun Woody and Picard invented the Galena or Crystal Radio, the first receiver in history. Picasso arrived in Paris in 1900 and he soon joined the vanguard of artistic movements. He reflected the anxiety and disquiet of those post-impressionists who sought new forms of expression. He absorbed it all and passed it through the sieve of his artistic personality. Picasso is undoubtedly the synthesis of the history of art in the 20th century. The nascent Art Nouveau shared the attention of critics and experts with the beginning of Cubism. Matisse, Rouault, Renoir and others were greeted by critics in the 1905 Autumn Salon in Paris as the wild beast, Les Fauves. But from 1819 to 1910, the architectural form of expression that best reflected the times is modernism. Antonio Gaudí created the Guel Park in Barcelona. A new form of viewing the world held sway. This uncommon